Chapter 6, Mishandling God's Mail Now that we have established the identities of various spokesmen as well as the primary location of our mail, the reader must be cautioned concerning some unfortunate Bible study pitfalls. One can only avoid misapplication of the principles of the previous chapters through careful and consistent attention to detail. Alerting the reader to four prominent errors associated to the mishandling of God's mail should help avoid some of the troublesome outcomes. The first one, retroactive misapplication. Forcing upon past dispensations revealed truths specifically for the age in which we live. This results from taking the full revelation of today's truth and forcing equal accountability upon past generation for truths yet unrevealed or hidden at that time. The chart on page 91 is titled Retroactive Misapplication. The second one is Prospective Misapplication, forcing upon the present age dispensational doctrinal instructions intended by God to be binding only upon past or yet future ages. The chart on page 92 is titled Prospective Misapplication. The third one is Replacement Theology teaching that Israel has been permanently replaced by the church in God's purpose and plan. This error negates God's future relationship with Israel by usurping yet unfulfilled promises of God, ignoring Israel's prominent future reinstatement as God's chosen people. The fourth one is hyperdispensationalism, forcing a false division upon the Bible, resulting in the exclusion of any part of the Bible or its precepts from their intended application today. This particular aspect will be thoroughly covered in later chapters. Progressive Revelation and Illumination These four dangerous pitfalls lead us into another important characteristic concerning God's spiritual male structure. Diligent Bible study reveals that each successive time period has more light and spiritual insight than any preceding periods. This happens because God has chosen to make his word known progressively through scriptural revelation and spiritual illumination, culminating with the eventual full illumination of John's revelation. In other words, earlier generations have lower levels of spiritual understanding available to them than the generations which follow them. For this reason, as a general rule, spiritually minded and scripturally minded Bible students have a better viewpoint of what God has done is doing, or will do, than any previous generation. Additionally, believers during Daniel's 70th week, along with those in the millennium, will have a greater understanding and illumination than what we have presently. God expressed these truths to Daniel when he was told to seal up the book until a future time and age. Daniel 12.4 But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. If you find these facts troubling, consider two fundamental truths concerning Adam versus John the Revelator. Adam possessed a very limited understanding in the garden compared to John's advanced writings from his exile in Patmos, Revelation 1.9. This is clear when you consider that God's revelation began with Adam and Eve and closed with John the book of Revelation. God ensured that Adam knew what he needed to know, but he knew very little in comparison to those who would follow after him. The chart on page 93 is titled Progressive Revelation and Illumination. No one would attempt to refute the fact that John had a more complete understanding of God, both his person and his work, in comparison to Adam and Eve. With this in mind, consider two specific applications of these particular truths. The first is, should the Bible student expect John's prophetic message to retroactively apply to the first couple in the garden? Two, should the Bible student prospectively apply God's warning concerning eating of that forbidden tree in the garden to John on Patmos. Stated simply, these examples incorporate different messages for different peoples in different time periods. And this is only one clear example among the many found in the Bible. Merely because some truth occurs in Scripture does not mean that it can be retroactively or prospectively applied to every generation or time. This may seem obvious, but misunderstanding these truths has damaged many men and women throughout the last six millennia of man's existence. Retroactive Misapplication 
Christians who consider how blessed we are to be living today are usually able to keep things in their proper perspective. Unfortunately, far too many Christians fall into the trap of taking for granted the truths that we should forever cherish. The saints of old did not comprehend many of the truths we know as the basic building blocks of understanding. They lacked understanding not because of some intellectual deficiency, but because they lacked the level of God-ordained revelation and illumination graciously bestowed upon the succeeding generations. The history of mankind has been illustrated best by considering a giant puzzle. God revealed himself and his plan for man a few pieces at a time. Of course, Adam and Eve were eyewitnesses of the initial pieces as they formed together. Each new piece of the puzzle put in place made the truth more evident with God manifesting himself more clearly. Yet a very real danger exists when future generations with their new pieces in place and their associated light retroactively force their views upon those who had already lived and died. One of the most prominent examples of this retroactive application involves the teaching that Old Testament saints placed their faith in the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross, also known as looking forward to the cross. On page 95, the chart is titled, God Reveals the Puzzle Pieces. The idea propagated by some is that beginning with Adam, there has been a continuous set of beliefs to which all men must subscribe in order to be saved. Although this may be true in a general sense, this incorrect teaching seeks to make the object of faith so specific that in turn makes God a liar and the Bible a mere fable. So why would men teach such things if these teachings so blatantly contradict Scripture? As Bible-believing Christians, we possess the completed canon of God's revelation in 66 books of the Holy Bible. In that Bible, we read of many accounts where Jesus, during his earthly ministry, prophesied that he was going to the cross to suffer and die. How could anyone, hearing him, miss the truth or misunderstand his teaching? Yet they all did. Additionally, how could anyone, witnessing all the sacrifices and feasts and holy days of the Old Testament, not see that all these elements pointed to Jesus? After all, even Jesus said that all the scriptures testified of him. Luke 24, verses 25 through 27, and verses 44 through 47. The Old Testament abounds in pictures and types with their obvious fulfillment in Christ. How could Israel have missed these truths so evident to the church today? John 5, verse 39, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The answer is not complex at all. The pictures and types found in the Old Testament, as well as in the parables and preaching of Christ in the New Testament, are clearly recognizable in light of the revelation and illumination of the completed canon of Scripture. In other words, our 2020 hindsight clouds our judgment, causing us to assume that previous generations must have known what we see so clearly today. However, the picture and type never comes into full focus until the object of that type appears on the scene. The Old Testament sacrifices, feasts, characters, etc. are unquestionably magnificent foreshadows of Christ. And what a tremendous blessing it is to understand and unreservedly teach these truths. However, it is unscriptural to suggest that the Old Testament saints grasp the same truths so obvious to us. Simply put, no one looked forward to the cross with the same understanding with which we look back to those sacrifices. The Old Testament saints had two overarching hindrances keeping them from grasping the truths to which we enthusiastically cling. Their spiritual eyesight was clouded by spiritual blindness and... The objects within their view were merely shadows cast by truer things yet to come, spiritually blind. According to the testimony of the Apostle Paul, the Jews' spiritual vision was veiled as they read the Old Testament. This veil upon their hearts is only removed in Christ. In fact, that same veil remains and will not be completely removed until a Jew's heart turns to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.14 But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Looking forward to the cross. 
Contrary to common teachings of our day, those living prior to the cross could not have been looking forward to the cross. Simply put, you cannot be a Bible believer and teach that the Old Testament saints look forward to the cross. It is impossible to reconcile this teaching with the very plain truths of Scripture. Keep in mind that just because a doctrine becomes prevalent does not make it any more scriptural than a lesser known teaching. Every man must choose for himself whom he will seek to please. Galatians 1.10 For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. There are many ways to prove that no one looked forward to the cross prior to the cross. In order to further validate these claims, consider the object of Simon Peter's faith. Certainly Peter would have had more light and more pieces of the puzzle than the Old Testament saints. After all, he sat at the feet of Jesus for over three years as Christ taught. Most would agree that Peter was one of the leaders of the disciples. Surely he understood and believed in the death, burial, and resurrection prior to the cross. Or did he? Consider these contentious problem areas for those who teach Peter and the others were looking forward to the cross. 1. Peter rebuked the Lord when Christ foretold his death, burial, and resurrection. Mark 8, verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. If Peter understood the efficacy of the cross, shouldn't he have believed that this was the only means of redemption? He understood no such thing. Next, Peter fought to stop the soldiers from taking Jesus prisoner, which would ultimately lead to Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. John 18.10 Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, smote the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. The servant's name was... Malchus. Why would Peter fight to stop the crucifixion if he truly understood its significance? He understood no such thing. The next one. After the women testified to him what they had seen at the sepulcher, Peter thought that the resurrection account was idle tales. Luke twenty four eleven, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Shouldn't Peter have been expecting this great news concerning the resurrection if he was looking forward to the cross? Be sure to read the entire account in context. He understood no such thing. Next, after the resurrection, as Peter looked into the empty sepulcher, he wondered what had happened to Jesus' body. Luke 24, 12. Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. If Peter was looking forward to the cross and the resurrection, why would he not have immediately assumed Christ had risen from the dead on the third day? He understood no such thing. With just these few thoughts, it is easy to prove that Peter was not looking forward to the cross. Could the other apostles have been looking forward to and trusting in the cross if Peter was oblivious of this event? One would think not, and the scripture clearly teaches that none of the apostles were looking forward to the cross. Consider Thomas's unbelief as a typical example of how these followers of Jesus handled the information concerning the resurrection. John 20, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Herein lies the great dilemma. If the disciples were ignorant concerning the death, burial, and resurrection, were they even saved? Of course they were. But this spiritual quandary arises because Bible teachers attempt to make the entire Bible uniformly apply to all generations throughout history. This causes profound and irreconcilable repercussions. Consider this dilemma. In plain speech, Paul declared that those who have the gospel hidden to them are spiritually lost. 2 Corinthians 4.3 But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. The fact that the disciples were blinded concerning the gospel can be proven from varying perspectives. 
However, this ignorance was not due to a lack of opportunity. In fact, Jesus very clearly communicated the gospel to the twelve, prophesying of his own death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel, the grace of God. Here's one of the many examples. Luke 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Verse 32. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. Verse 33. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. No preacher standing on this side of the cross who understands the import of Christ's death burial and resurrection would suggest that a man blinded to the truth presented in these verses was a saved man. However, the context in the next verse plainly states that the disciples did not understand Christ's prophetic pronouncement, specifically the death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, the next verse in context clearly says that Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was hid from them. Look at verse 34. We read verses 31 through 33, Luke 18, 34. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. The gospel writers point out that the twelve apostles did not understand what Christ was saying. In fact, the gospel that we preach, the death, burial, and resurrection, was hid from them. If the gospel which we preach was hidden from the twelve, were the apostles in fact lost? Had Jesus misspoken when he pronounced that none but Judas was lost? Does the Bible contain contradictions? No on all three accounts. Again, no, no, no. This is why one's approach to the Bible determines the extent of light and depth of understanding. Those who haphazardly approach the Scripture stagger at the insurmountable hurdles or simply turn a blinded eye toward the truth. A man either believes the entire Bible or he stands accountable for his infidelity to the Scripture. The chart on page 100 is titled, Filling in the Puzzle. Using the method of Bible study employed by far too many seminaries would mean that all of the apostles were lost because the Bible says that the prophecy of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was hidden from them. Yet teaching that any of the apostles, with the exception of Judas Iscariot, were lost makes the following statement by Jesus a lie. John seventeen twelve. While I was yet with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Consistently considering the context of a text is the only means whereby the entire Bible reconciles itself. If the apostles were lost because the gospel was hidden from them, the Bible contains contradictions and errors. Any Bible teacher who places typical scholarship or the teachings of his beloved alma mater ahead of God's word eventually falls into the abyss of spiritual infidelity. For this reason, and many others, it is unrealistic to teach the typical everyone was looking forward to the cross doctrine without explaining away, ignoring, or changing some seemingly contradictory verses. None of the Old Testament saints grasped the cross. None of them. Their developing puzzle was missing many important pieces and did not yet clearly identify these truths. The disciples had it hidden from them. Therefore, certainly the apostles could not put their faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Those who preceded the apostles were likewise blinded to these truths. In fact, the apostles came to understand the cross after he was risen from the dead. John 2.19 makes this clear. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Seeing shadows. It is true that those who lived prior to the cross were hindered by their spiritual blindness, yet their difficulties did not end with the blindness. The objects they viewed were spiritually incomplete, similar to a shadow merely representing its object. Examining a shadow offers a representation of the object minus the detail. The detail is only visible when the object is in full view. 
On page 101, the chart is titled Image Casting a Shadow. For this reason, Old Testament truths served merely two-dimensional shadows of things yet to come. The earthly ministry of Christ declared the person work of God in a more explicit form than available to man prior to Christ's incarnation. This is because the Lord on earth was the express image, three-dimensional, of the invisible God. Colossians 1.15 Who, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. The previous chart illustrates this truth. It demonstrates God's dealings with man from the Garden of Eden to eternity future. According to the Apostle Paul, Old Testament feasts, holy days, priests, and even the law were mere shadows of things to come. Colossians 2.17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And of course, that is referring to the Old Testament feasts and holy days. Hebrews 8.5, who serve, that is the Old Testament priest, who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for. See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. Hebrews 10.1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Here is a good analogy. By viewing a man's shadow, certain features of that man are indistinct and sometimes even distorted. The same holds true of the law. The Old Testament was incomplete in its capacity to express God's person and work. It could never fully declare or set forth who God was or his ultimate plan for man. Mankind needed something with greater depth and enhanced dimension. Simply put, the world desperately needed Jesus, God manifest in the flesh. What the law could not do, Jesus Christ fulfilled in the flesh. This is why the Bible emphasizes that Jesus Christ came as the image of the invisible God and the express image of his person. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Colossians 1.14 in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Hebrews 1, three, who, that is God's Son, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down the right hand of the majesty on high. The Lord achieved what the law could never materialize. This is why Jesus said to Philip, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, John 14, 9. How could this be? It is because Christ was God incarnate, 1 Timothy 3, 16. The law pointed to these things, but only Christ's incarnation could make them a reality. Similar to a shadow serving to point to the man it portrays, so the law served to point to Christ whom it portrayed. God had a purpose for it all. Galatians 3.24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law could not adequately set forth what Christ would accomplish through his sacrificial death upon the cross. It could only picture it in the sacrifices, the feasts, the rock, the brazen serpent, etc., those men who lived during these times without a full understanding of the future simply saw sacrifices, feasts, a mere water giving a rock or a serpent. They did not see Christ in picture or type. Yet as we look back, we see clearly Christ in those elements. What a glorious time to live as so many of the pieces of the puzzle give the church an adequate understanding. In the future, Jesus Christ will return not as the image, but as the Son of Righteousness with healing in his wings. Malachi 4.2 Man will then see God in all his glory. The Bible foretells that not only shall man see him, but those who know him shall be like him. Psalm 17.15 As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. What did the Old Testament saints grasp from the teaching of the shadow? Moses was not contemplating messing up a type of Christ when he smote the rock a second time, Numbers 20, verse 11. He was angrily smiting a rock at a 
second time because of the provocation of the people. Hezekiah was not disgracing the crucified Christ when he broke the brazen serpent and called it Neshetan, 2 Kings 18.4. All he saw was a brazen serpent that Moses had made for the people's healing that had become an idol. He saw only the shadow and not the express image that the brazen serpent represented. Peter cut off a man's ear to keep Jesus from being put to his death because Peter only saw his king being arrested, Matthew 26, 51. How do these men differ from us? We are on the other side of the cross looking back with the necessary revelation and illumination. We can clearly see Jesus, the Savior of the world. Why? Because we are on the other side of the cross looking at the shadows with 2020 hindsight. The pitfall occurs when teachers retroactively apply today's truths upon a previous generation's shadows and somehow teach that they too must have envisioned the image that we clearly see. How God deals with man today cannot be applied outside of God's intended boundaries. Only by rightly dividing the word of truth can one consistently and accurately apply Bible truth within God's intended context. Again, we are commanded to study, but we are also given instructions concerning the God-approved method of Bible study. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Bible teachers need to be consistent and honest, which only comes from studying the Bible using God's method of Bible study. Otherwise, we as workmen are at risk of God's disapproval and our shame. The next chapter considers the mishandling of God's mail through perspective application, that is, forcing upon the present dispensation doctrinal instructions which were intended by God to be binding only upon previous or yet future generations. This is the end of chapter 6.